Good morning, Edgewood Congregational Church, and welcome to Thanksgiving at Virtual Edgewood. It's November 26th, and I'm so glad you can gather with me here in this, in this space to reflect on the gifts of today um, and to begin to smell the wonderful aromas coming from the kitchen. I know it's raining outside, and it'll be a quiet day, much more quiet than we had ever anticipated, but we are here together. And we are here to celebrate God and to give thanks for our life together. Please join me in worship. Grace and peace to you from God, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. Who knew you and chose you before the world began. Who loves you so much that God calls his own children. Who has brought you from darkness into light and filled you with glorious power. Who has prepared an inheritance for you that will never spoil or fade who encourages you and strengthens you in every good deed and word, who comforts you in your trouble so that you can comfort others. This is our God, the ultimate source of all things, and the one for whom we live. Let us worship together. Join me in the response of invocation. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. God blesses us with gifts of love, with food and clothing, home and family. God blesses us with daily work and all we need day to day. God protects us in time of danger and guards us from every evil. God calls us into relationship with God and forms us into one holy people, the church of Jesus Christ in this place. Therefore, we shall offer thanks and praise to the Lord our God. O Lord our God, we will give thanks to you forever. Our readings for today come from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 7 through 18, and uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, 6 through 15. The first reading from Deuteronomy. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and who repays in his own person those who reject him. He does not delay, but repays in their own person those who reject him. Therefore, observe diligently the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that I am commanding you today. If you heed these ordinances by diligently observing them, the Lord your God will maintain with you the covenant loyalty that he swore to your ancestors. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. You shall be the most blessed peoples, whether sterility, uh, with neither sterility nor barrenness among you or your livestock. The Lord will turn away from you every illness, all the dread diseases that you experience. He will not inflict on you, but he will lay them on all who hate you. You shall devour all the peoples that the Lord your God is giving over to you, showing them no pity. You shall not serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. If you say to yourself, these nations are more numerous than I, how can I dispossess them? Do not be afraid of them. Just remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. And from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may snare abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. 
He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God, God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. Well, they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for this incredible indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. In this year of a pandemic, an important anniversary in the history of our country has nearly been forgotten. 400 years ago, English religious separatists reached the shore of what is now Massachusetts and established a colony, colony that became a touchstone for American democracy. Plymouth was founded by those who sailed on the Mayflower, it was not the first colony established along the eastern coast of the Americas. Jamestown had been founded in 1603. The Spanish had claims on what is now Florida, and the Dutch, too, were eyeing the mid-Atlantic region of the eastern shore. But the political organization that came from an agreement among the English on the Mayflower moved European colonization beyond mere economic propositions, such as in Jamestown to a social and moral compact or covenant. Also in the past year, we recall the 400th anniversary of slaves being brought to our eastern shores at the Jamestown colony. For four centuries, we have lived with an economic plan, an immoral plan that made human beings a commodity and a vast labor source. It is a shameful legacy that our country still lives with today through racism and inequitable economic and educational opportunities. At the very heart of these two anniversaries is the stark reality of racism, where white men, although oppressed for their religious views, could be free to establish a new political system on far off shores. African men, women, and children lost their humanity on these very same shores. Furthermore, the Thanksgiving we commemorate today came from a moment in time, a rare moment, when the English and the indigenous celebrated a harmony. The Poconoc at Wampanoag literally saved the lives of the English by sharing their land and knowledge of planting and hunting. The Plymouth colonists owed everything to them. Yet within a few short decades, bitter disputes over these very land sharing rights turned horribly wrong during King Philip's War, a conflict that nearly annihilated tribal life in southeastern New England. It has taken all these centuries to honor the true place of the Wampanoag, Narragansett, Pequots, Massachusetts, Micmacs, and many more tribes in the founding of New England. And yet still these people are in a never-ending struggle for recognition, for federal recognition, social, economic recognition. Thus today we celebrate the day we celebrate today is so much more complex than having a turkey dinner and watching TV or a parade. As well as being a time of thanks for this fourth century legacy, it is a time to reflect on the depth of that history and to recommit to how our country can lean into the true meaning of a land for all, a land of equal opportunity, a land where all people can aspire to, for the best in themselves, a land of generosity, a land of hope, a land of peace. It seems that the experiment that was Plymouth is not yet done, but ongoing. And we are still very much a part of that experiment. As I finish, I want to share the verses from one of our national hymns that appears in the, in the, in the New Century Hymnal. It means much to me because it, it, it speaks out to the fact that America, while it is a unique experience, it is not the only enterprise in this globe. This is my song. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts and other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country skies are bluer than the ocean and sunlit 
beams on clover leaf and pine, but other lands have sunlight too, and clover and skies are everywhere as blue as mine. Oh, hear my song, thou God of all the nations, a song of peace for their land and for mine. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a prayer that peace transcends in every place. And yet I pray for my beloved country, the reassurance of continued grace. Lord, help us find our oneness in the Savior in spite of differences of age and race. May truth and freedom come to every nation. May peace abound where strife has raged for so long that each may seek to love and build together a world united, righting every wrong. A world united in its love for freedom, proclaiming peace together in one song. Join me now in uh, the prayers of the people. And I take this, I actually found this uh, prayer, which was written by Walter Rauschenbusch, who was a minister and was really a leader in the um, social gospel movement in the late 19th century. For the wide sky and the blessed sun, for the salt sea and the running water, for the everlasting hills and the never resting winds, for trees and the common grass underfoot, we thank you for our senses by which we hear the songs of birds and see the splendor of summer fields and taste of the autumn fruits and rejoice in the feel of the snow and smell the breath of the spring. Grant us a heart wide open to all this beauty and save our souls from being so blind that we pass unseen, when even the common thorn bush is aflame with your glory. O God, our creator, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Today, as we gather, we give thanks for this great nation of ours. We give thanks for how this democracy was constructed. We give thanks for the right to vote, <laughs> which is unique. In, in the world at times. We give thanks for all of the brilliant minds that laid the foundation for this country. Most important, dear God, we pray for the scientists and medical professionals in our country and across the globe who are working to end a vast pandemic, so virulent, so insidious, that it is taking millions of lives now. We pray for those in our own city who work in our hospitals, who are fighting back this pandemic. We pray for them and for their families in this Thanksgiving day. We pray for all who are hospitalized. We pray for all who have tested positive for the COVID, vi COVID virus. And within our own life, our own community, we pray for Janet and Janet, Joe, Joyce, a friend of Bill and Dee, Michael, Brenda, and Raymond. And we continue to pray for Brenda's uh, family as they grieve the loss of her brother, Wayne, who died uh, this past weekend. And now join me in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Join me now in a prayer of thanksgiving during the pandemic, uh, by, uh, written by the Reverend Thomas Whiteson. Great God who calls us to belonging, who delights in curiosity, invention, ingenuity. Praise be for minds that bend and flex despite restriction, for bodies that single love by staying apart. Praise be for neighbors talking across fences, calling from balconies, waving through windows, for greetings that cross the space between us. Praise be for strangers careful on footpaths, for children asking their questions, for truth tellers who earn our trust and speak to our fear. Praise be for friends who warn and chide and encourage, for human worth in time of distance. Praise be. And now I come to a, the benediction and, and uh, our, our closing hymn, which I hope you'll sing with me. But before we do the benediction, I just want to give thanks for Edgewood Congregational Church for the courage you've shown during the past year 
to give over to new ways of worshiping, to how you have sustained the church itself during this time, for the ways in which you continue to bring prayer and music and uh, joy to the members of this congregation. Grant us now, gracious God, an opportunity to continue to worship together, to share in God's bounty, to give thanks for all of God's love poured out on us. Amen. And now, may we always walk gently upon the earth in right relationship, nurtured by your love, open to the wind of the Spirit, taking only what we need, always open to the needs of others, making choices that bring well-being, living with generosity, striving for justice, honoring all with reverence, reconciling and peacemaking, mindful of those who will come after, recognizing our proper place as part of your creation. Grant us strength and courage, Lord, for such a radical transformation into your kingdom. Amen. And now, join me. I hope in your homes you will join me. God be with you. God be with you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you. God be with you. God be with you till we meet again. Amen. Please join me Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We're going to do service live through Zoom. I'll be sending you information and a service order. Um, hang in. We haven't, we've only done this once before, so we're going to try it one more time, and I think it'll work just fine. We all have become so much more adept at, um, at, vir at the virtual world. So I will send you information and blessings on this day and into the weekend. Be safe, be well, and I give thanks for all of you. Amen. <laughs>